are in the bowels of a hospital, a sprawling complex organism, a massive body of concrete and mechanics created by human beings to minister to the flesh and blood needs of its makers. Its mysteries are a source of dread for even the most self-assured. Its existence a reminder of mortality, for it is a house of life and death. The organism's beating heart is its vast workforce. Each job plays a vital part in the health of an entity charged with nothing less than the care of our earthly existence. The high-profile aristocracy of the medical staff exists side by side with the world of the workaday cleaner. Even the most mundane task has dramatic consequence. Cleanliness in the hospital is critical. It can also be difficult and disturbing work. I seriously, seriously thought of it. This is not for me. And the way I was looking at it, if me and my wife, if we didn't have to be just buying a new house, I would have walked away. <laughs> you know, whoa, to see that much damage, right? I figured, you know, see a little bit there, probably a broken leg or something, right? But when just gentlemen come in, I mean, and there it was. <laughs> Everything was just wide open, right? I, I didn't think there was that much blood in the body. It took me a good, I said probably three weeks to get over that just thinking about it every night. Right? It was the only time I lost all this weight, and now I got it back again. <laughs> it can be as quiet as the grave in emergency. It's a strange waiting game. All these trained personnel in a state of suspended animation waiting for what is about to happen. When emergency is boring, that's good news. When they're busy, people are hurt and suffering. Emergencies are as diverse as human activity. In the hyperbaric chamber, divers are treated for the bends, a painful, potentially fatal condition that occurs when they resurface too quickly. There we go. How you doing there, Krista? How's the pain? I don't know if you've been in one of these before, but it's like when we're diving. Roger that. One, two, three, four, five. I heard you loud and clear. Let us know when you're ready for a seal. Ready for a seal there, number eight. Okay. It's very important. If you feel that you're having pressure build up your hair, you let me know. How's the leg doing, Jim? Roger that. Thank you. We'll reassess in 10 minutes. You're dealing with acute illness, and, and so sometimes it's pretty minor stuff, but when, when you get the really bad stuff, I think it's harder, more so dealing not necessarily with the patients, because when they're really ill, they're, they're disoriented, they're not really aware of the situation. But then going to talk to the families and dealing with the issues, you know, um, whether it's end of life care, because, you know, primarily that's what we deal with a lot of times here. The first few times it happens, then it's harder. You know, when 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 you get um, when you've been through it, you know what to expect, and so as time goes on, you're a bit more prepared. 
but uh, you know I think back to one case in a, in a young lady who was in her mid-twenties and then to go out and tell her husband and they had a small child at home I think that was sort of when you know that that situation that you've done whatever you can but you still can't fix somebody that's that that sort of brings home the, the difficulty of the job to watch older people no. don't, don't don't bother me no more right no it's just See, these young people just got their driver's license. We all to ensure that you've done that, <laughs> right? That was burnt. And where are you to, man? He's not supposed to be here, no, that's what doctors are telling him. He's not supposed to be alive. So, but he took home, he was watching the news, and he got tightness on his chest, so we got ready to take him to the doctor. And when he got one shoe on, he started to stumble ahead, and I said, you got to go back till we get an ambulance and get you that way. If I never got in through the door, when you're on the floor, I hauled me with him. Until the late 19th century, sick people were cared for at home. They were born in the upstairs bedroom and they died there too. Hospitals were holding areas for indigent sufferers and the mentally ill. Florence Nightingale and the Crimean War invented the modern hospital. Soldiers had to be patched up for another trip to the front and there, Nightingale introduced her revolutionary brand of professional, humane nursing services. The discovery of bacteria as the cause of disease was medicine's great leap forward. When doctors were required to wash their hands with soap and water, the death rate for new mothers dropped by 93%. Hospitals were no longer simply places of refuge and care. They became specialized institutions where treatment and diagnosis was increasingly aided by technology. And now we have come to the hospital city. 10,000 people daily enter the doors of this health sciences complex in St. John's, Newfoundland. Some 500 are employed just to keep the place clean. Mary Wynne Clare is the director of this crucial labor pool. I think there's a certain satisfaction in cleaning. At the end of the day, you've got a, your job done and you've done a good job. And I also think that there's more to it though, that they play a role in the care of the patient. And, you know, maybe they don't think about that every day, but it is part of what they do. Recently, I had a friend whose child was in the hospital, very critically ill at the time. and. Um, he stopped me one day when he was visiting in the hospital and he said on one of the most critical days, one, one of the days when they really didn't know how things were going to go one way or the other, he said it was the conversation with the housekeeping staff member who kind of I guess saw what they were going through, was it, were able to stop for a few minutes and talk to them. It was that particular conversation that got them through that day and that night. But I do think housekeeping still hasn't receive the recognition that possibly they could receive. I guess it's a very subtle kind of thing, but it's kind of like, you know, they're almost embarrassed, you know, or something that you're in housekeeping. People have very basic reactions to a hospital. Fear and revulsion are high on the list. People lose their autonomy in the hospital. You take off your clothes, get in the bed, do as you're told. You're surrounded by sick people and old people, by needles, knives, awful sounds, strange smells, by medical staff moving briskly from room to room. No wonder talking about the weather is comforting. The housekeeper is approachable in this strange and frightening place. Long left again, second time. Long left. Well, in this movie, I guarantee you when you finish. 
I hope you go upstairs, are you? Yeah. <laughs> well, who knows, maybe you will. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, George. How are you, sir? Great, and you? Excellent. Did you hear anything after? And no, heard nothing. Yeah, nothing. I've been in housekeeping about four years now. I was with the hospital previous. I was the baker, actually. When I used to talk about it and my friends used to talk to me about it, I used to, without a doubt, I think my pride was probably damaged the most in feeling like that I was stepping down. Now, I guess that's your chair, isn't it? Yeah. All right, I'm not going to take it out of there then. I like the patients, and that's probably the biggest reason why I didn't want to go with MPD or medical records, because I was going to be burned in a little office, even though, you know, the human resources manager said, you're going to take housekeeping over. But, you know, I, I, like, I like people. I like to be out where, yes. So I do like that part of my job. And, you know, and none of it is really... The end of the world now. When I came first, I thought oh, it was the end of the world. Oh my God, how am I ever going to do this? You know. But again, you know, a lot of it was pride. When you sit down and think about what housekeeping has to do, they have to clean 2.4 million square feet of space every day. When you talk about central laundry, they do 8.4 million pounds of laundry every year. When you think of what a sheet has to go through. You think things are simple, but they're not. Anyone who's ever stayed in the hospital knows the routine, blood collection at the break of dawn. The collection team sets out from hematology at 6 a.m. The rumble of the carts is the first sound of the hospital's new day. Good morning. Are we all awake? Yeah. Mr. Dehan? Yeah. I got some blood to take from you this morning. Okay, Have you got an iron band down? Okay. Question number one. Yes, you do. Okay, let's verify. And you got no veins in your hands either, hey? They're short or they're crooked. So that, that won't work either. That's not an option. <laughs> you fellas are up on the go early this morning. You're early risers. I love patient contact. If I couldn't have patient contact, I don't think I'd want to work at what I'm doing. And it's always nice to touch, touch a patient. Here we go. That's right. Not a big fan of needles, was it? No, that's right. But I can't think of any other way to get that blood out. No, there's no other way. Did you realize the blood is the window on your body? Yeah. Everything that goes on. So you can't tell any secrets, you can't no. tell any lies, they'll find out about are laser images of white blood cells, each color representing a different cell. And this is leukemia, dancing on the screen. The body is dissected cell by cell in the labyrinths of the hospital's basement labs. When I was in grade six, we, we, uh, we had one of those tours, and uh, you know I kind of made up my mind then that I wanted to get involved in, in working in the hospital and, you know, particularly in the lab environment. <laughs> the first thing that we do, we actually take the specimen 
and we put it on various media plates. We actually have to grow the bacteria. Gail has a plate there now which she's taking off some of the bacteria mm -hmm. that has grown overnight in the incubator. You see the next day, you can see all the circles around the drugs. You can but tell the physician. But there's one pill there that, that obviously didn't do any work at all, right? Yeah. Exactly. So you wouldn't give, prescribe that to this patient. Ninety percent of every patient who walks into our doors will require some form of laboratory test. Put it this way, before you're born, you probably had a lab test done. Before you leave this earth, uh, you've probably had some lab tests done before you actually left the hospital to go for your, for, for your final burial. You got some blood here that needs to go. Oh, here it is. Excuse me. We get called every kind of name. We're vampires. We're bloodsuckers. Right? But we don't care. We don't mind. As one shift of workers streams towards the hospital exits, another prepares to take its place. We never stop, you know, we just never close. Today. Yes, uh, I'm a night nurse by choice. I have more time to spend with my patients to talk to them before bed, certainly, and in the morning. I worked in ICU and it was more machinery, and I, it, I didn't like it, so I left, obviously. I do like talking and joking, and I can remember uh, one old gentleman, he was leaving, giving me a big hug and kiss, and so glad to see me come back from a shift. And that kind of lifts your spirits and keeps you going. Okay, great. Well, Everything's normal. So carry on. More, huh? You're still saying, well, you said that last night, you're still I know, here. I'm I did still warn here. you, you're not going to get out that fast. Oh, no, you did. You gotta, you gotta, we got to get those sugars under control, yeah. hey? Okay. Find out what's making them go wacky on you, right? Yeah. Tonight was really quiet here. So about a couple of months ago, we had a lady here who had, uh, she came in with headaches under neurology. Turned out that it ended up being a, a massive bleed in her brain, so we had to take her downstairs to CAT scan. That was quite an ordeal, rushed to CAT scan, then we had to come back, and ICU came and got her, and she ended up going to ICU, and around 3 o'clock she ended up going for a brain operation with one of our neurosurgeons. So that was a three, that was about three, three hours, four hours, went like that. I like being what we call down in the trenches. I would like to say it gets easier, but it doesn't. I don't cry anymore at work, but that's not saying I don't feel anything, because when I go home the next day, I could be uh, brushing my hair or vacuuming, and all of a sudden the tears just start to run. Okay, sure. Dixie cup and orange juice. Excuse me. Every nurse is, is different. There's some nurses that, that are very good nurses, but they're, 
they keep to themselves. And again, you can't please everybody all the time. It's like any profession. But I think when you start complaining about nurses, everybody feels like they're complaining about you too. Have a good night now. Check on you later. We have to work together. If we don't support each other, you know, it, it, it's not going to work. It's just it's going to break down. You see a lot of new grads coming out, saying, oh my God, why did I choose this profession? And you'll hear of the stories of people not going into nursing anymore. That's why there's such a sh shortage across North America. Nursing was one of the first professions to admit women. But the image of the angel of mercy seems to have lost its currency. My daughter just finished university and nursing never entered her mind, even though her mother's a nurse. Med school, maybe, but uh, I guess everything is open and I guess it's just got to be more, maybe we've just got to be out there more political about saying, look, this is not a bad life. Hello. Good evening. How are you? I'm fine. Have a good day. Yes, Dolores, you're my favorite nurse girl. Yeah. How are you? Oh, good, I'm great. Can I check your vital signs you now? Sure can. Healthcare workers on the wards circulate constantly. But as they move from room to room, they must ensure that the sickness of one patient doesn't spread to another and then another by way of the human touch. Infection control is the province of Dr. Jim Hutchinson. I was thinking of a funny kind of anecdote in my sort of realm. We were speaking of the SARS epidemic going on. The Center for Disease Control said we we're making more travel advice, telling everybody from the United States that when they're in Toronto, not to visit a hospital if they don't have to. And I thought, I could give travel advice to anybody <laughs> every day of the week for your rest of your life, never go to a hospital if you do not have to, no matter where you are on the planet, and that would be a reasonable sort of advice. So this kid's got some patient? Uh, you can't go around the PC plate. No? Yeah. I haven't checked the safety yet. Oh man. This. Look at that one. The hospital being a place where there is a lot of antibiotics used, it tends to be the place where the most resistant bacteria congregate, if you will because they are able to survive in an environment where there's lots of antibiotic. There was a Canadian study done that this institution was involved with a few months ago that looked at a whole bunch of hospitals across the country and looked at all the people that were admitted on a particular day. 10% of all the people in the hospital on that day had an infection that they acquired in the hospital. And those resistant bacteria, we really were try to stop them from spreading around from person to person within the hospital. And the main way that the spread occurs is through the hands of healthcare workers. So a lot of the effort is to encourage proper practices when dealing with dressings and wounds, etc. And then lots of hand washing. And doctors tend to be the worst, to be honest with you. I'm being facetious, but I, to be honest, it's, it can be very difficult from the infection control perspective and the general hygiene perspective. The housekeeping staff are essential, obviously. But I think I would make the first line the actual physical structure of the building and proper engineering and conception at the beginning of, of building buildings that are for healthcare. I think is the very first step. The building itself is much more than bricks and mortar. Its very walls pulse with life. The organism keeps its defenses high. Its built-in immune systems are powerful enough to keep it humming even when the rest of the world goes dark. Heating ducts and air conditioning pipes snake through the ceilings. Oxygen and anesthetic are delivered via arteries moving through millions of feet of space opening into the operating room or beside the hospital bed. There's been studies showing that if you have an outbreak of whatever in a hospital, like say MRSA on a given ward, the rates of other kinds of infections during the time where you're publicizing it go down 
in general because all the practices that we should all be doing all the time come up. People's hands get very red during these time. We have lots of people that need more care for their hands because they're washing so often, etc. I've thought that it might make some sense to have some sort of fake outbreaks around. <laughs> Just, oh, geez, we got a little problem going on over here. You should be worried. You know that proper hygiene is everything. And you don't want to pass nothing on to no one who don't want it. So that's it. Down one corridor go carts of garbage. Up another come carts of food. The hospital's arteries are always pulsing, delivering all the body needs through its circulatory systems. Morning, got your breakfast, Despite all our advances, hospital food has apparently not improved since the Crimean War. Here you go. At the heart of the hospital's circulatory system is materials processing and distribution, where surgical instruments are decontaminated and returned into the organism's ever needy bloodstream. Any mistake down here is reflected upstairs. A non-sterile instrument may be fatal. The hospital is a fascinating place. There's so many different people every day. There's no day that is the same as the previous day. On a medical school I left, I did research, I did a PhD, and I, I was intrigued from the very beginning with the heart. And I, just, I thought at, at that stage, I'd like to just carry out research sort of at the frontier, if you like, discover on a very minute scale how exactly the heart works, electrical currents, that sort of thing. But after spending a lot of time in that field, I thought, you, you miss the patient contact, because it's always nice to bridge the gap between the research and how it affects the patient. And cardiology, with the amount of new technology now, allows you to marry those two things extremely easily. All right. Well, Mr. Snow, how are you doing today? Good. Good? Good. Mr. Snow, he essentially had his heart stop at home and only about 5% of people will actually survive that kind of event. The heart takes off, effectively there's no pumping and you're dead. The only way to bring you back to life is to get a shock. And you've, people have seen it, they watch the ER on television, they may have seen it themselves in the emergency room, but paddles get put on the chest, shock's delivered, the heart restarts and life is re-established if you like. Today, Mr. Snow will have a device implanted in his chest which will automatically shock his heart back into life should it fail him again. That's always on film, right? You know, people do that. <laughs> So that's just a little freezing there now. Okay. How do you feel there, Mr. Snow? Good. Good. Not swearing it up. Oh, he's doing well. What's that? You feel a little bit of there, yeah. You feel a little sharp there, Mr. Snow? Okay. Give you some more freezing. Are you pretty active? Yeah, uh, oh, not too bad, uh, yeah. His wife said it, the morning uh, it happened, he was painting. Mm -hmm. So, of course, my question was, did he finish it? <laughs> That's right. He said no. No, didn't get a chance yeah, to finish right. your painting, hey? No. Or painting, were you? Yeah. These used to be the size of footballs that would be implanted in the abdomen but now clearly small enough that we can move up to the chest and, and a much less invasive operation. 
The ICD has been something that we've invented or, you know, in North America in the last 10 years as a process whereby we can implant a small computer underneath the skin, up here in the, just below the collarbone, and that's connected by a lead down to the heart. The lead acts as an antenna, and then the same thing can happen, but within a person's own chest. So now we're going, we are ready to put his heart into fibrillation now, or stop it, and we'll see if the device can shock it and bring it back. Okay, he's in ventricular fibrillation now. Device is charging. There was a shock. Okay, good. So we've successfully stopped this heart and restarted it from auto detection from the implanted device. So we basically put the patient in the worst case scenario and proved that the device would bring his heart back to normal rhythm if this were to happen at home. We're going to do that two times just to make sure. Excellent. Back to normal sinus rhythm. Okay, so the device passes all its tests and uh, we'll declare that a success and sew up the incision. We take someone from a 95% chance of dying outside the hospital to probably a 98 to 99% chance of surviving the episode. <laughs> Mr. Snow's heart, uh, although weak, is not extremely weak, and he tolerated the procedure very well. It was a short procedure, so he he did have very deep anesthesia, but only for short periods of time, five to ten minutes. Yes, yeah, so in between, he was very short-acting anesthesia, so while we were doing just some suturing and, and minor positioning, he sort of drift up towards consciousness, and then for the fibrillation and the shocks, he was actually very deep. I think we've realized for a long time that without the heart, you don't live. So people have realized it is the center of us, if you like, the, the person. And so therefore, all our, our primal emotions, I think, get directed and associated with the heart, because without the heart, we are not who we are. We're dead. And, uh, and so I think it's not, uh, we, we see why over the ages we've ascribed all these very primitive emotions to the heart because it is associated with life and what we enjoy in life comes because the heart beats. Okay, let's come right in here. Let's come on over to the side here now. Yeah. <clears throat> The handrail's on the right side for you when you go up. How do you feel? Too bad, just a little... A little winded? Winded, tightness to the side of your right? Okay, we're going to stay here until you catch your breath before we walk back, okay? Okay, it's pretty good. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, I'll get the door. We give pillows to our patients after they have open heart surgery. It can be quite uncomfortable then for the patient after surgery, especially with coughing, laughing, sneezing, so any of those. Sure. Just hold it right over the incision like that. And when I have to make a hard cough or something, just hold it tight and then make the cough. And that sort of holds everything together inside, but lets the Mucus and everything come up, right? Heart operations are serious and elaborate. The surgeons who deal in death-defying feats are at the top of the hospital hierarchy. But when the operation is over, there is still critical work to be done. The next patient may survive the operation, but they may not survive the infection. Once a week, you want to get through every room and get to the top of the lights and make sure that everything, this place is filled with a lot of electronic components and dust sucks in everywhere. So that's the key too, to getting the dust out, right? So beyond that, yeah, this is what I'm at every night. Yeah, talking to myself. <laughs> we don't need a multitude of education for our department, but like anything else, knowledge sometimes is more important than what's on a piece of paper, in my opinion. 
it, this is a family thing. I have my whole family works here actually. So beyond that, yeah, I inherited a job, I guess. <laughs> yeah, she's looking pretty well shaped up. You can't move any of the computers out. This is the only thing. Dust and everything, right? You get a lot of. That's my main beef. I hate dust. We know that we're an important piece of the puzzle here because uh, it's truly it. We are, well, once the room is dirty, you just can't use it until we get in there and clean it for you. What? I'm you out. You develop almost like that sixth sense of uh, who's a nurse, who's a doctor, who's a porter. Because we all know each other by only masks only, right? Ready for her. Mr. Snow and his compadres in the Wars of the Heart are on their way out of the hospital with a new lease on life, happy just to be alive. Drink extra milk or juice when you're thirsty because it'll raise your blood sugar. Okay. Don't forget we talked about cutting down on the caffeine too, right? <laughs> Meanwhile, in maternity, brand new humans show a distinct lack of appreciation for the gift of life. Baby, it's her, it's, it's getting adjusted to it. I had to have this, an emergency section. It was very traumatic for me. I didn't know what to expect. All I know was bed was rolling, I was going into the emergency room at, for the operating room, and but it worked out fine and we're both fine. So that's the main thing. It is hard to get rest in hospital because there are people constantly coming and going. It's hard to get rest. Stretchers, gurneys and carts rumble ceaselessly through the hospital, bringing new life down the hallways and coming for the dead. The hardest question that you'll get is when the family asks you, how long do you think? We always say, that's not in our hands, that's in God's hands. Or, but we try to keep your father or your mother, or your brother or sister, comfortable as possible. And your worst shift is when that do come, and you're with the family, you're grieving with the family, and then you have to take the patient to the morgue. That's, your, that's the yuckiest thing in nursing, probably. We have to tag and wrap and that part. Every morning, the first thing I do is check the morgue to see if we've got bodies there. And if so, we check to see if there's autopsies. The bodies are put into this register when they come into the morgue. What I would do is check the name tags on the bodies against the names in the register, and also check to see if there's going to be an autopsy. Uh, this room here is a body freezer. It's at uh, minus 40 degrees. If we get a body that we want to hold for an extended period of time due to identification or uh, no one claiming the body, we can put them in here and we can keep them there for an unlimited period of time. We could store basically from floor to ceiling because you can stack them, but there's normally one or two people at a time. Organs are removed from the body during autopsies and they don't go back in. A dead man may well go to his grave in a considerably lighter condition. Liver, lungs, brain, heart. These specimens are stored for teaching and investigation. In the pathology lab, dead and living tissue is embedded in wax blocks and prepared for further scrutiny. 
What I basically look at is a glass slide that contains a very thin slice of tissue that has been processed by the technologists in the lab. The autopsy is a very small part of what we actually do. The autopsy rate has gone down dramatically even since I started training in pathology, um, largely because people have um, so many investigations prior to death. Thank you. Down a microscope, there's drama, there's sadness, there's anxiety. Anxiety both for me uh, in trying to make sure I get the right diagnosis because it's, uh, it's not always um, very obvious. And then there's the drama for the patient. Today there is good news down the microscope. Encouraging results have come back from the lab in a serious and vexing case. He's had cells all weekend. And he doesn't have fever. And he doesn't have fever. Unless he got a fever like during engraftment, you know. This Where weekend. is he now? He is 221. Okay, why don't you get this? He, uh, like I said, I'm just so tickle pink with him. And his wife actually is tickle pink. He's pleased. And he's pleased. The patient, his wife, is just like they, you know, his wife, once again, at ICU, you know, she's been taking pain. Actually, she might be gone home again. Mr. Right. LaRue, how you doing? Where's your wife? Yeah, very soon. Oh, I, she didn't go home yet. You're looking good on paper. On paper. Huh? Nice. Anyway, they're going to, I've told them that I think it's a, a time now to have another CT scan of your chest to look at that thing. So we can see if it's getting smaller, bigger, or whatever. Now that you've got cells back, we've got a few more options for having to fix it. So uh, we'll get that look, and then I'll we'll talk to you after we see that, OK? Pharmacy kind of keys into every department in a run of a day. I know in my case, and in certain other pharmacists too, they, they actually have to meet with the whole team. Have you seen the CAT scan, do you know? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Each cancer and at various stages requires different drugs and they're very complex protocols. So one of the things I would do on hematology in conjunction with the physician is writing up the protocol, the right drug, the right dose, how to mix it. There's only a pharmacist that can actually physically get into this department. And then of course the storage of narcotics come under a special federal laws whereby double lock cupboards, steel doors, wire mesh. Again, not even the fire department can get into a narcotic department. If by accident you happen to drop something on the floor, with number of people involved proving that it was dropped and actually gathering up the glass that it came from and holding it for the narcotic inspector. I got a different motto of life in that we're all in the same boat. I may not be sick today, but I will be sick. I've had numerous family members and I've had family members die here um, and we're all going to be sick and we're all going to require the health care system so whatever good job we do now it's only going to get better and better and better as time goes on so by the time I need it but I'm old and gray and possibly senile um, there's good, good people that's trained and good people there to, to fight for my rights when I'm not in a position to do it. Canada's publicly funded healthcare system, although in constant crisis, is still a world leader. But higher costs must be countered by an increase in efficiency. Patients are moved in and out of hospital with an eye to the clock and the cost. The human element doesn't always survive the shuffle. Modern technology has vastly increased the possibilities for diagnosis and treatment, but there's always a price. Is it worth the price of a pretty good new car for Mr. Snow to have a new lease on life? Oh, he's a lucky man, all right. Complex equipment and treatment requires an increasingly high ratio of staff to patient. There are 5,000 workers at Health Sciences and 437 patients. 
It's easy to question expensive procedures which keep a premature infant breathing or give an elderly person another few months of life. But the price of life is difficult to assess when the child, or the mother, or the grandfather is your own. No matter how we advance in technology and treatment, or how we deal with questions of cost, the hospital, like its makers, will die without its heart. And that is the workers, and the care that they give, the work that they do, day and night, night and day, in a world where people and their problems are infinitely changeable, even as the cycle of life and death remains endlessly the same. Keep going. Good work, Adam.